Uh, good evening, everybody. Let us go ahead and get started with our session today with our guest speaker, Dr. Rosalind Vargas. Uh, let me go ahead and just give a brief introduction uh, to our guest speaker today, and then um, she'll uh, continue and lead the session for us. So Dr. Rosalind Vargas uh, is one of my faculty colleagues. I've known her for, I believe, uh, the last 20 years or so. Uh, she's currently an assistant professor of business administration and the director of Masters of Science and Human Resource Management program at Bridgewater College in Virginia, uh, city of Bridgewater. She has taught at the higher education level for over 20 years now. Her teaching fields include human resource management, human resource analytics, uh, organizational behavior, leadership, and management class uh, in general. Her research focuses in the area of human resource management analytics, as well as in the areas of innovation and disruptive management. So Dr. Vargas has worked in the field of human resource management for over 25 years, much of it uh, here in South Florida, which was nice. So she's very familiar with our area in our college, obviously. She was a director of human resources for multiple companies. She's fluent both in English and Spanish. And we are honored uh, to have her here. Uh, and Dr. Vargas, again, thank you very much for uh, being our keynote speaker for this semester for this class on HR analytics. Uh, so welcome to our class and to the college again. The session is all yours now. All right, thank you. Um, you know, I couldn't, I, I wouldn't be where I am at today if it wasn't for a lot of um, the faculty and colleagues um, from no. So I see a, a very familiar face who happened to have been a, a co-teacher of mine at one point. Um, we co-taught together, and then was eventually my dissertation chair. Um, so all that I've learned. Um, actually took forward to Virginia and, and they're pretty happy with it. So, so I wouldn't be where I'm at today with, without the help of um, a lot of you from NOVA. So my heart, go, my heart is always there with you. All right. So one of the, the things that, you know, when asked about doing something for HR analytics, uh, which became very near and dear to my heart, um, actually <laughs> at the beginning of writing the dissertation, and so it's been a, a little while since I've actually dusted off um, some research as I was busy um, writing a program uh, for uh, a master's program. And actually, it's the third master's program that the college now has. They now have four, but it has, we boast about the fact that we have been, are still um, the most successful master's program within the college itself. And so going back and, and saying, well, let me go back and, and see where do I where do I want to begin with this? And so I thought that part of what I wanted to talk about was where where did analytics even start? So I titled it HR Analytics, then now and in the future. And the future, you know, what does that hold for us and for um, a lot of the HR professionals and students that are taking um, specific classes in HR and, and how do we embrace how do we embrace um, HR analytics? Um, quite interesting. Most of the times, people do not want to um, talk about numbers. And so, as mentioned, I had taught at NSU um, for quite a few years, and then in 2015, I started teaching a course um, titled HR Measurement. Um, so you'll see as we talk about a timeline of where HR was at one point, um, that's really where it all started. And then it kind of went forward to the analytics piece uh, because that's big data came in. Uh, we're talking about artificial intelligence now. And so there had to be a little bit of a shift to the push. And there's the shift is going forward. The push is sometimes going back. And so we kind of play with this thing um, with the analytics part of it. And sometimes maybe changing the, the terminology um, would embrace, um, people would embrace it some more. And so I'll go back and say that even in 2015, when I first started teaching the HR measurement class, I would always start each class, each term by asking students, how many of you decided to do the MS and HRM instead of an MBA? And a lot of hands would go up and I would say, was it because of the numbers? And that was the big yes. 
And so I would tell them, well, you might want to pick up your books and walk out the door because guess what? There's numbers in HR. <laughs> um, I don't think that people really understood that piece. I don't know that they realized that even payroll resided in a lot of HR departments as well and that HR folks were doing payroll. And so there were numbers. So I want to talk a little agendas, small nuggets of, of what HR analytics is and where it's where it came from and where it's going. So we'll talk about the introduction, a timeline of HRA um, with different terminology as measurements. What were the primary goals of my research um, besides the fact that I wanted to complete the dissertation process? Um, and then we'll look at HR then, which moves us forward into the now and then going more further into the future. A summary and then we'll have um, a little Q&A if you would. All right, so the introduction. So what is HR analytics? There are numerous definitions out there as to what HR analytics are. And I chose um, Laurie Bassey's uh, definition as, as the one that I really like to hold on to. Human resource analytics has been defined as the application of a methodology and integrated process for improving the quality of people-related decisions for the purpose of improving individual and or organization performance. And so uh, I, I, don't, I don't want this to be a one-sided conversation. Uh, I'm an HR kind of person by heart. And so here's a question for those of you that may be on. Uh, does, the, does the word methodology um, kind of give you the heebie-jeebies, the little shivers of the, oh no, it's a stats class. Okay, well, I will go back to all of the courses that I have taught in the past um, where that has been a yes. I am actually teaching HR analytics. This is the third cohort of the master's program. And it's the same thing, I still get the same. It's the statistical piece, it's stats, it's everybody thinks of statistics as, I don't know, a bad word. Um, meanwhile, if you think about what happens election years, we're always looking at stats. Um, there are surveys, if you are a sports buff, we all know stats. Um, so there's this whole piece of, I don't know why the word methodology, so on and so forth, kind of scares everybody. Um, but but it really shouldn't. So the timeline, how far back would we go? And so just a, a small nugget, and these, this is by no means an exhaustive list. Back in 1909, we'll talk about Frederick Taylor. Um, in 78, we move a little forward, forward and talk about um, Jacques Fitzsens. 92, Kaplan and Norton. And then in the 2000s, Beckler, Ulrich, Ulrich and Euclid. And then Wayne Cassio and John Boudreaux, who are still out there writing. And then from 2014 to 22, um, where are the academicians? And that is a huge question. Where are they in terms of writing for HR analytics, um, looking at surveys, looking at where, where have we gone? Um, in one of the courses that I was teaching, in fact, this past term, um, a student actually asked, well, where is it now? And I said, that's a good question. Maybe I need to get the dust off of my, my research and start looking at it. And in preparing for tonight's session, I started looking and I realized there's a lot of work still to be done by academicians. And so even as I worked on research, I had a lot of um, reviews as, as things were being submitted that said, well, there's a lot of practitioner literature but where is the evidence from the theoretical pieces? Where are the academicians? So that's a big question for me. And so we talk about the future. And so where will we go from there? All right, so the primary goals for my research, one besides, like I said, is completing that doctorate degree and doing that dissertation, was looking at, so the dissertation title was Adoption Factors um, That Impact human resource analytics among HR professionals. And so what I was looking for was, what are the barriers to the adoption of human resource analytics among HR professionals? It was a question that I asked, but based on some of the answers that I got from classes, I was almost sure it had something to do with the numbers. And so gotta find out with the research. And so then the other three pieces are both information 
taken from the dissertation, but the next two individual adoption, the use of human resource analytics came from a conference um, that I attended. Um, and then the slow adoption or no adoption of human resource analytics among HR professionals was another conference I had presented at. And then the last one, the individual adoption of, of human resource analytics, a fine grained view of the early stages leading to adoption is actually a published article. In fact, one of my co-authors is on Dr. Tu Roger. All right, so when we look at going back to that timeline, the HR analytics, the then, and we look at Frederick Taylor, um, also known as Taylorism, who's known as the father of scientific management. And he really looked at efficiencies and tied scientific measurement principles to labor force planning. And so I somewhat did the same thing with um, my research, taking the decision sciences and tying it into um, the HR profession. And as we go through and start thinking about theories, I actually dipped into the health science, well, healthcare. Um, and so that was an interesting piece to find out, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but Frederick Taylor's philosophy was more focused on the belief that making people work as hard as they could was not really so efficient. What he looked at was time and motion um, and, and concluded that there were certain people that could work more efficiently than others and that that's what managers needed to seek in individuals as they were going through the hiring process. Jack Fitzsens um, in 78, so he's been known as the father of human capital metrics. An engineer by trade um, and definitely not an HR person, but eventually wound up there like a lot of HR professionals, um, they wind up in HR by accident. So this has been happening for many years, I just want to let you know, right? And so he looked at HR activities and the impact that the bottom line could have and should be measured, right? There were a lot of disagreements, especially from the HR practitioners. A lot of the disagreement came from the fact that HR professionals felt that they were being looked at in terms of their performance. And what he was trying to say, it wasn't necessarily their performance. It was more the performances of their practices and procedures. So in other words, if we think about it today, what are our hiring practices like? Um, when we do training and development, what works, what doesn't work? Looking at the, the return on investment. So there was a whole different look. And it took a long while before people really jumped on the bandwagon with him. Um, to understand what he really meant. But he was a thorn in some sides, but he kept going on with his work. Um, Kaplan and Norton in 1992, they developed what was called a balanced scorecard. Again, think about what I said about even the courses that I taught at NOVA. The, the title was HR measurement. It was not HR analytics. And this is exactly where these gentlemen were going. And so they developed the balance scorecard, which allowed for the tracking of, of the performance of the HR teams, um, looking at the growth of the business, the process of any um, customers, satisfaction, and then the finances, going back to the, you know, what is the bottom line. From there, um, Becca Ulrich and Uslin then wrote a book titled The HR Scorecard. And so they really looked at the HR metrics as well in terms of key performance indicators of HR deliverables um, and said that these things can be measured. So again, the data was used to predict the potential growth of the organization. And is that not what we do with HR analytics today? It, so it's just a, an, an involvement of a lot of work that people have done from the past, right? And sometimes terminology just changes a little bit. Passio and Boudreaux um, started playing around in the 70s and 80s. They developed utility analysis. And that just looks at really the process um, of predicting or, or explaining really what is the usefulness um, of the decision at, uh, options. And so it looks at, are we making the right decisions? Now, it says 1970s to the 80s plus. Um, it could be and beyond. They are still out there writing 
um, very much in, in fact that they have got a textbook that I've used, um, Investing in People, the Financial Impact of Human Resource Initiatives. The book does have a website on it where you can actually, they're connected to SHRM, um, and you can utilize the website to actually do the calculations for certain things. So it's if 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 it's not being used, it might be a good thing um, for students to might want to look into, and it might help them in terms of understanding the measurements and how they can utilize the website to to get information on the cost. And so this is this is the sample that was used for the research where everything else comes from. So there were 302 HR professionals that were currently working in an HR function that was a must. 47% of them were HR specialists, 35% HR analysts, and then 18% are managers. 79% of them were women, uh, which is not unusual. But if you go back to thinking about HR in its inception, uh, back when it was called personnel, and in some governmental entities, it is still called personnel. Um, they haven't gotten up with the times. A majority of the folks that were running the departments were men um, because they had that foresight on, on numbers, I guess they thought. And think about that. We'll talk about that later on. Um, and the women were more doing the paper pushing. And so there's been a big shift. And if I look at the numbers today, it may be even higher. 88% uh, of them had a master's or, or bachelor's degree. And then the average tenure working in HR was 15 years. So that was pretty good um, sample in terms of different roles that they played um, and then the amount of time that they, they spent in HR and then the level of education that they had. And so when we look at the HR analytics now, and these were some of the things that came out of the um, survey right from from the dissertation and then other pieces that uh, we pulled out but the what were the barriers and so two of the questions were do barriers exist for hr professionals in adopting analytics for human resource management and then what is the cause for disconnect between the organization wanting to use analytics and the HR professional's ability to adopt and deliver so a lot of it still went back to the individual themselves and so in looking at the different theories, we looked at self-efficacy, um, you know, how do people feel about their own ability to do these things? Quantitative self-efficacy, having to do with the numbers, social influence, which was nothing more than if, if Sherm said, this is what we should be doing, that's usually what everybody is going to do. That if more HR professionals were using human resource analytics, the word would get around and more people would, would jump in. And then are the tools and the data available? HR has had data is, since its inception. There's, there's data, HR just holds a lot of data. Sometimes I don't know that HR professionals really know what to do with the data. Um, but then the tools that are necessary, that's gotta come from the organization. And then the piece on fear appeals really came from um, the health side of things. and. For an example, and the, the best example is um, if people say, or when the health professionals said, cancer causes, uh, smoking causes cancer, people stop smoking because of the fear. It didn't say smoking may cause cancer. It says it will cause cancer. So that fear that's in there, right? And then the effort expectancy. Um, if HR professionals felt that it was easy to use, they may adopt it, they may embrace it a little bit more. And then on the organizational side, was there lack of support and resources? And in smaller companies, they may not have been able to, at that time, um, purchase an HRIS, right? Or get some other kind of platforms where larger organizations can. On the use of HRA, the implications of the organization's adoption was looking at it differed between whether or not the individuals um, either embraced it or what their position was. And the important piece of that was really the organization, in that case, going top down and then specifically promoting their use 
um, in HR. So if the organization said, this HR analytics has need, there's a huge need for it, we need to get involved in it, we need to understand it a little bit more, it does affect the bottom line. Once they have that, I think more HR professionals would have then adopted the use, right? And so looking at those things, um, was that the, the problem with the adoption? The slow adoption or no adoption and looking at that, we looked at three different roles um, that the adoption takes place in or, or that you need for the adoption. One is the knowledge, the training, attitudes, and self-efficacy. And so in looking at the three different um, positions, the specialists, the analysts, and the managers, and looking at the three steps, whether or not to adopt, um, in terms of the knowledge piece, the HR specialists felt that there would be a great impact um, on the qualitative self-efficacy and the attitude towards HR analytics uh, if, there was, if, if the knowledge was there, if they had the knowledge, if they had access to the knowledge. The analysts um, thought the same thing, but the HR managers, interestingly enough, they had absolutely no, no um, specific way of saying yay or nay. And I think a lot of that is if you think about the time that this was done, 2014, 2015, a lot of folks that were in HR, that were HR managers and above, really wound up in HR by accident. There was no degree in HR at one point, um, very limited use of either a certification, with, whether it was through HRCI or SHRM. And so a lot of these folks were, they were afraid of the numbers, so they were not going to push one way or the other. And so when we looked at the persuasion piece of it, the HR specialists felt that, yeah, if they had training, it would in definitely increase their quantitative self-efficacy, and it would also increase their attitude on quantitative analysis. And so, again, it goes back to the training. The analysts said the exact same thing. The HR managers, again, there was no impact at, at all in the step. And so one can only imagine that if you look at the average tenure um, going back was 15 years. That was the average, but there were a lot of people that were all over that, that hurdle um, past the 15 years. I'll exclude myself though, because I like HR, HR analytics. But, um, and then when it came to the managers, um, the, it significantly was related to the attitudes towards human resource analytics. As long as the managers were willing to promote it, everybody else was gonna wind up being on board. Um, quantitative self-efficacy was significantly related to attitudes towards the quantitative attitude, but not directly related to adoption, which was kind of interesting. And so again, looking at all of the different pieces, a lot of it had to do with where people were in this stage of their career as well. Um, those that had the master's and the bachelor's that may have been on that beginning spectrum um, was also, you know, a little more into adopting. And then the last piece, taking a closer look at those three steps, it came out that knowledge, um, obviously was important resource required for the employees to adopt. If you don't have the knowledge or the training, it's not gonna work. The lack of self-efficacy can be improved by providing analytics training and support. And then if individual users are not statistically sophisticated, but have good subject matter expertise, which is usually the case with HR folks, then roles in cross-functional analytic teams could be designed. Um, I, I don't know now companies who do not have an analytics team. So they may not be working necessarily in HR, but they can be working with HR. So it's trying to get HR folks to understand that there are people out there that can help them. They do not need to become statisticians, but they have a level of expertise that analysts and statisticians may not know what to be looking for, but HR folks do. And so where's HR analytics going to in the future? And so 
On the academicians, so as I was doing research, Marla and Boudreaux, they conducted a review of the HR analytics literature and found very little and limited scientific evidence to aid in decision-making concerning whether to adopt HR analytics. It's just not out there. And so those were some of the issues that I myself found. There were 32 peer-reviewed articles that they found, 16 were listed on the journal quality list, and ultimately only four studies were empirical in nature. And so that goes back to the pieces as I was turning things in, a lot of the academicians in their reviews were saying, you have a lot of practitioner literature, but you don't have enough academic, academic or theoretical. And so it's because it was not out there. And note that they did that in 2017, and my research was done 2014, 2015. So it even took a couple, even a couple of years later, there was still a lack. Um, and so the study, the study that I did really answered the call um, for empirical studies. And so moving forward, like I said, I need to brush off some of that research and, and get back into um, writing because there's a lot of work to be done. In terms of HR professionals, um, they need to understand that this is a necessity anymore. It's not a, not a, it would be nice to have. And so they need to enhance their professional development with more knowledge on um, human resource analytics. They need to promote it within their departments and or organizations, and they need to seek the guidance from analysts with statistical experiences. Well, how do we get there? So on the teach and learn, um, that should take place in universities and colleges and, pro and HR programs. Um, SHRM and other professional organizations should make HRA as part of their HR certifications. Um, as I was doing research, it wasn't until well after my dissertation was done when Sherm actually published an article talking about HR analytics. So they were even behind the game a little bit. And then academicians really need to do more research on HRA. It needs to be embraced by HR professionals, understand the importance. Um, there are so many job availables now. Now, the, when you start looking, um, they're looking for people with analysis background in HR. And so it's becoming a little more prevalent for folks. Um, they need to seek the training in HR and then students in HR programs must begin to adopt HRA and use social influence to diffuse the uh, human resource analytics. And so it's interesting to see classes that I have done in the past and current um, where they start out the first day of class and where they end up when they finish. Um, so they embrace it a little bit more. Um, and then on the implementation, they, organizations need to be supportive and give the resources to HR professionals so that they can do this work. And then the resources could come in the forms of either an HRIS system, different platforms from third-party vendors, or the hiring of analysts or, or a statistician um, that they can actually work with. And then the summary, um, while not so new, HR analytics, just it was coined, maybe HR measurements, it was called the balanced scorecard, it was called an HR scorecard, it was called all kinds of things, um, continues to be of central importance to the field of HR. And so there's an abundance of articles by practitioners on HR analytics. Um, a lot of vendors have got, done research and put a lot of information out there. Um, there's a need really for further exploration from a theoretical perspective. And then current and future HR professionals really need to embrace and adopt and use um, HR analytics ex exponentially. We need to be more ahead of the game than behind the game. Um, it, you know, what's going to happen is that at one point, it used to be that HR folks should never report to um, the finance person um, because they used to clash because HR was known as nothing more than a cost center. And I could go back and give you some history, stuff that I heard. I won't, I won't. <laughs> um, but nowadays it's becoming more and more that the finance department is overseeing a lot of HR departments. And so if that's happening, if, if you don't step it up as an HR professional, um, you're going to be left behind by the, the finance folks. And, and that's just, Back to the back. Um, that's my presentation. I will take um, any questions that you have. So thank you so much for the wonderful presentation <laughs> and so much content covering the history 
over the past century, starting with Frederick Taylor and all, all the way to now. And I'm glad you pointed out so many areas where our uh, HR uh, students and undergraduate students and uh, in their professional careers, as they move on to maybe doctoral programs, they can specialize in some of these areas that are uh, needed, uh, as you mentioned. So we need more researchers in the area and we need more advancement. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, there's now plenty of time for questions. So Rookie, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Vargas. Thank you, Dr. Mushtabai. Um, you know, when we talk about quantitative self-efficacy and um, analytics and numbers, we use analysts with our investments. You know, our companies, we always hire in uh, analysts to really look carefully because we're looking at investment. And it's really time, I think, for um, managers and company owners to actually give the mandate to the managers to really see the working force also as an investment. And that's where I think we fail. Um, it's very important that we also follow in a way the outcome data that comes out of different companies, group companies who use teams, analytical teams for HR versus um, a different structure where it's more sort of individual based. Because when you have teams, you can have people who are highly trained, analytical, um, tech savvy, who um, use the technology easily, sort of combine their skills with people who have experience in dealing with other aspects, because not everybody can be good as everything at everything. But an HR team, in my experience, works much better than an HR person. And that, that means you have to invest. Um, it means that a company has to invest in its workforce. And that investment of course, eventually leads to better investment for, for a group of companies. Maybe this is a matter of size. It's, it's a matter of cost. Um, but again, what you said at the very end, um, the HR department is seen as a cost. It should be seen as an investment. Um, we, we really need to do that. Now, my question is, I mean, after that reflection off of what you said, I just, I, I sort of had to share because in, in, I believe in teams and our, my companies have teams of analysts, but how do we track the outcome, the short, medium and long-term outcome? Um, who really, are you able to, as academicians, sort of penetrate some of these companies um, and get the information of how these teams work, who has teams, what size teams, how do these teams uh, work, how are they composed, and what type of investments um, and what type of departments or sub-companies do these groups have and how well do they do over time? Are you able to penetrate that, to do your research and get that information? Because that's the only way we're going to get more information back to the um profit companies the nonprofits do it but the profit companies don't okay i'm gonna kind of make comments um on things that you said and then try to answer your question um so in terms of you're right with an hr team um a much easier but there are still so many departments of one um where there's only one person in hr and if no one has ever been there, I got to tell you, I've been there. Um, you, there, you learn a whole lot of stuff um, because you're the only one doing things. If a company is small and they do not have the funds or the means um, for some of the technology that's out there, although there's so many now that some of them are, are they're pretty accessible. The use of Excel can still be, it, it can be done. If you know the right questions to ask and you start getting answers, you can start to see trends. If you just think about just even turnover rate, you know, it's easy. People have been doing ad hoc reports for years in HR. What's the turnover rate? And they punch in a bunch of numbers or they get out, they spit out a, a report and it tells you. But what there's more to that. Why are we having all this turnover? What is the cause of the turnover? If you start to notice that it's in one department only or in two departments, then what's causing that? 
It may not be the entire organization. So looking at those trends, um, so having a team is wonderful, but sometimes it's not, it's not conducive. Now, in terms of the research, what's happening right now and what's been happening is that a lot of vendors um, will put surveys out. And so naturally, you've got to think about they're trying to sell a platform. And so they're giving you the survey, they're giving the results, and they're saying, our platform is going to help you do X, Y, and Z. Well, I can tell you, having been a practitioner, that um, there's one very large company that I love to death. I've worked with them a whole lot of time. But the problem becomes is that they have different pieces, different platforms that they actually purchased from somewhere else. And they sell it to you as a package. The problem is those systems don't speak the same language. So you're running reports from different pieces of that same platform and then trying to make heads or tails. And so when researchers, when academicians are actually doing research, they're not looking at it as a selling point. They're looking at it as being evidence-based that this is what we're talking about surveys and really I think the biggest key was doing what I had done was to specifically ask only those that were working in HR at the time to fill out the survey. Because if you were retired, well, you may not have had that opportunity. Um, if you're not working in HR, you may not understand what really is necessary or going on. So I think that's the big key. It's really the piece of once you get the information, um, it's more evidence-based and it's not, it's not a company trying to sell a platform. And I think it just holds a lot more water. It's like, why are we not, why are HR professionals? And I still can say we as an HR professional, I can't get rid of it. Um, why is it that we don't embrace it? What is, what is the issue? Um, so we've come up with some things, but it could be a whole lot more. And I'm sure that you know, there, there are more than 302 HR professionals. Um, so it's having the time and to do research and get that many more people um, to take the survey, maybe update a survey, so on and so forth. Does that answer your question? It, it does. It's such a wide question, I think, and there's so much going on, but it's really exciting to see that um, the, um, analytics is sort of expanding um, and there are all kinds of questions, of course, relating to HR with large companies and production companies and AI and robotics. I mean, technology taking over as well. So it's a huge subject and I'm not going to go there and I don't want to take you there. I don't want to diverge, but um, thank you for your presentation. It certainly makes us think and it's wonderful to know that you're out there um, and, and uh, colleagues doing this so thank you thank you and we have another question from hector uh he passed it on to me uh so he probably doesn't have an access to the microphone right now but uh, his question is what do you think the impact of covid will be to human resource analytics uh, will we have a turning point that will be negative or positive for the future impact of human resource analytics to enhance employee performance and help recover our economy? If you have any thoughts on that, Dr. Vargas. Wow, that's a great question. So it's interesting. Let's just talk about COVID and the HR professional uh, or the HR profession alone. Um, so when I was asked to write a program for the, a master's program, I thought, I've only been here a couple of months. I don't even know if I like it here. And I don't even know if you guys like me. Um, so that was an interesting piece. And it happened right about at COVID time as that program actually went into effect. And after doing my research, um, I boasted about the fact of the HR profession and how many positions are going to be out there and how the profession is growing. And all of that came from the labor Bureau of Labor Statistics. And when COVID hit, I thought, oh my, what's going to happen to the HR profession? And I really thought that it was going to go by the wayside. In reality, it has picked up more. And so I think that the analytics really, I don't know that that would put a standstill. I think the, the, 
the adoption of HR analytics is still at the same place. I don't think that COVID pushed it back any um, because as you can see, the profession has moved forward. I still get emails from Sherm all the time on a weekly basis. The last one I got, 192 new HR positions available. And that's higher management because that's what I put in for. It's there. I talk to HR professionals all the time. Um, I am connected to a local chapter of Sherm in the Shenandoah Valley because I oversee the student chapter of Sherm at the college. And so even the connections there, um, HR professionals are saying they are so overwhelmed with work because think about what happened. You know, everybody went home and then it was like, come back. And now, oh, I don't want to come back. Okay, well, maybe we can do hybrid. And so HR professionals are just doing this juggling act. Um, and I think that HR analytics will probably help them in terms of seeking out even how much work is actually getting done while people are at home based on, on either keystrokes, if some companies are looking at that, but just, just the outcomes, the daily work outcomes. Remember a lot of people actually said, I don't wanna go back. I don't have to pay for childcare. I don't have to pay for the high gas prices. I don't have to, there's a, a slew of reasons why people don't wanna go back. So I don't know that that would have a negative, that COVID had a negative impact on the HR analytics itself. Um, I could tell you that it's not showing that it has had an impact on the profession itself and or the number of, um, of positions that are available. I hope that answers his question. Another question? Okay, he did write that. Thank you, Dr. Vargas. Uh, that is an amazing piece of information and answer. Another question to follow up on this would be for those who are studying international business or globalization to some extent, where do you believe HR analytics is impacting uh, globally? And, and, and as Americans, are we competitive in terms of analysis and analytics in general compared to the Indians and the Europeans and the Chinese? Uh, what, what kind of encouragement or suggestions do you have for our students to make sure they are competitive with the rest of the world? All right, that's interesting. Um, so my research, I never, I never looked at the globalization, but I will tell you, that there are more and more companies that are global. And so there's no getting away from it. I, I just think that a lot of, and, and we'll go back to the, the measurement. I'll, I'll say uh, one thing that I didn't mention and, and I'll, I'll mention it now was that in the research, and it'll kind of tie in, in the research that we did, um, one of the control variables was gender. And so, as you, if you recall from one of the um, prior slides, if you looked at the number, I'm gonna see if I just bring it back up. Um, 79, 79% were women. And so if you, if you think about how women have always viewed, and I don't wanna say all women, I gotta be very careful with that, right? Um, how women have been viewed in terms of their liking numbers. Um, it's always been on the negative. And so in 2014, which was the time of the research, 76% of HR managers were female in that research. And then approximately 69% of SHRM members were actually women. I checked with SHRM, that's a pretty huge number. Um, but then there was prior research that stated that women are limited by their own beliefs that traditionally male occupations are, are not suitable for them and that they feel that, the lack, that they lack the aptitudes to, to master essential skills such as data analysis. And what's interesting is if you think, think now, how many more STEM schools don't we have? And how many more, uh, take the note as to how we are pushing more women um, into the sciences, technology, the mathematics. And so I would say it's not just women. I just think that we need to stop thinking that there are other countries that are more advanced than we are. And we just need to step it up some um, and embrace it and, and take away 
take away that fear. And I think that's really where, where the, um, where the problem becomes is it's just being afraid of it or feeling that we're, we're inept somehow. And, and I don't, I don't believe that that's the fact. Unfortunately, the biases and stereotypes have always been there and, and it's negatively impacting uh, both men and women and the stereotypes, unfortunately continue to obviously, uh, uh, be there even in today's environment. Some of our students who are listening to your presentation and will be seeing this uh, are actually doing research papers on diversity right now and uh, gender as well, the impact of gender. So any recommendations in terms of how analytics have been used or could be used uh, for HR programs to make sure that there are no discriminatory practices in their work environment when it comes to hiring promotions, uh, or just any of the protected categories being adversely impacted. Any suggestion from you would be appreciated. Yeah, so going back to um, one of the slides when I said, where do we, where do we go um, from here? And I, I just have to say that it's, what's interesting is that the learning and the teaching um, really have to come back. When I started doing research for the master's program at Bridgewater, I started to look at like schools. It's a small liberal arts college. Um, so I started looking at like schools to see who had an HR um, master's program. And then I looked at those that were there, how many of them had an HR analytics class. And so then I took it out a little further and just looked regionally. There were larger colleges and universities who said they had an HR master's program. When I looked at analytics, it was very rare to find that there was a class on HR analytics. And so I think that's a lot of where, where we're really lacking. And I don't know if Dr. Tu Roger remembers, but um, when we were, when I, we were at the conference in um, Little Rock, Arkansas, and so being new to academia and conferences, at the last minute, I just decided to just like shoot from the hip. Um, and I asked a question there, all academicians, how many of you teach HR? And everybody's hands went up. I said, how many of you teach HR analytics? Not one hand went up. <laughs> I, Dr. Vargas, it's Leslie to Roger. I, you, it was a terrific presentation. I'm so glad I was able to make it. I think some longitudinal research is, is due now. <laughs> I think we need to go back out and take a look and see how far we have come and, uh, and, and look at some of the gender issues. I know I've had interactions with two HR professionals recently and they both come out of finance. They didn't come out of HR. Now they're heading HR for their organization. So, um, you know, they like that math and analytical background, I think you know, in those positions, those CHRs. So anyway, terrific presentation. And, and I think some more research from all of us would be a good idea. <laughs> well, I agree. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll just put it out there whenever anybody's ready, um, let me know there. I am a solo um, at Bridgewater. And so when I wrote that program, I wrote that program on my own. Um, so it was quite interesting, but those were the things that I found out is that when you start looking, HR analytics is really not taught. It's, it's, it's a hot topic. Obviously, and many schools are struggling now to hire enough faculty. As you mentioned, we don't have enough researchers. We don't have enough people who can teach the class. So all programs are suffering from this, unfortunately. So now we only have a few more minutes left. Any other burning questions? I have a lot because I was writing, obviously, all kinds of stuff for research and also for, uh, for questions. Uh, but, but I don't want to take the time because we don't have a whole lot of minutes left. So any other final questions from anyone for Dr. Vargas? Okay, if not, I would just like to say again, thank you so much, Dr. Rosalind Vargas, for the session for agreeing to again uh, contribute to the HR profession and and obviously you know you're one of the leaders in the field because there have not been too many people but you're one of the top leaders because you've done a doctoral degree in research 
um, in the area of analytics. So hearing all of this stuff directly from you and devoting one time to us is great service to the profession and to all of us. I'd like to say thank you for having me, um, for asking me and for bringing me back home. Um, NFC will always be my home. And so, um, and my email address is on the slides as well. So if anybody wants to email any questions, I'll be more than happy to take them. And I do want to emphasize that not only, you know, you've been so kind enough to make yourself available, but I also want to emphasize to everyone that your dissertation is probably one of the best dissertation theses out there. I'm not sure how many people have downloaded it, but it is available for everybody. And it's a phenomenal piece on HR uh, analytics. So thank you for making that reference for us available. And everybody should be able to download that on their own, actually, uh, as a PDF file for your research for citations and future publications. And also you made the reference to uh, other publications that you've done with uh, Dr. Tu Roger and other colleagues. So we look forward to reading all of that as well. Thank you, Dr. Tu Roger, for attending as well and supporting our session. And uh, those of you who do not know who Dr. Tu Roger is, she teaches many classes. She's been with NSU for, uh, I guess, since the 1990s, years. right? <laughs> 20 years now. <laughs> that, that, that is full time, right? But you were teaching yes. even before that. So yes, you've made a huge contribution, not only to the field of HR, but uh, also to NSU in general, to the academic environment. So I, I'm thankful that you are here. And it was my pleasure. And I always like to interact with Dr. Vargas and you So and all of your students. So great to be here. And so not only Dr. Drew Roger and I are here available for all of you, but now Dr. Vargas has also agreed to uh, answer any questions and she made her email available. So uh, again, thank you so much for that as well, for being connected back with your home university here and you'll always be a part of us and uh, we enjoyed your session. Look forward to more sessions and research with you in the future, Dr. Vargas. Happy Thanksgiving holiday to you and to your family and to all of you who are in attendance tonight. So thank you everybody for attending. Thank you, Dr. Vargas again. Have a good night and enjoy the holiday season. Good night, everybody. Good night.